is our future. Now I want to make quite sure that I will not be misunderstood. I am not using this occasion as a platform for putting forward ideas other than those which I hope will help to bring unity, prosperity and happiness to South Africa. I see our republic, the republic of the English and the Afrikaans speaking alike. governing what is the heritage of white South Africa, joined together as one by the very task set them at this time. Through this unity, cooperating in solving its special problem of race relations, so totally different from problems anywhere else in the world, Unity. Prosperity. And happiness to South Africa. Gentlemen, we as colleagues and representatives of the people in the Parliament of the Union of South Africa are assembled here today on a great historic occasion. We have in our midst the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. It's the first time we have been honoured in this way. We indeed appreciate it, but more particularly that you and Lady Dorothy will enjoy your visit in South Africa and return to Great Britain with great renewed strength and a good knowledge and understanding of problems of South Africa. Allow me to welcome you also in Afrikaans. Hartlik welkom, meneer de eerste minister, keer lekker en kom weer. President, Speaker, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege to be invited to address the members of both Houses of Parliament in the Union of South Africa. In town or country, we have been received in a spirit of friendship and affection which has warmed our hearts. In the 50 years of their nationhood, the people of South Africa have built a strong economy. In addition to building this strong economy within your own borders, you have also played your part as an independent nation in the world. Your resources greatly assisted the recovery of the Stirling area in the post-war world. 
Now, in the no less difficult tasks of peace, your leaders in industry, commerce and finance continue to be prominent in world affairs. Today, your readiness to provide technical assistance to the less well-developed parts of Africa is of immense help to the countries that receive it. It is also a source of strength to your friends in the Commonwealth and elsewhere in the Western world. All this proves your determination as the most advanced industrial country of the country to play your part in the new Africa of today. Mr. Prime Minister, you've set me a considerable task. We have problems enough in, so enough in South Africa without you coming to add to them to make such an important statement and to ask me to thank you in a few brief moments. There are two ways in which one can approach a motion of thanks, as you very well know. The first is practically to repeat and endorse every statement that you make. But that, of course, presupposes that one can endorse, which I can, cannot in all instances. The tendency in Africa for nations to become independent and at the same time to do justice to all does not only mean being just to the black man of Africa but also to be just to the white man of Africa. We call ourselves Europeans, but actually we represent the white men of Africa. They are the people, not only in the Union, but through major portions of Africa, who brought civilization here, who made the, possible, uh, the present developments of black nationalism possible by bringing them education, by showing them this way of life. By bringing in industrial development, by bringing in the ideals which Western civilization has developed itself. And the white man who came to Africa, perhaps to trade in some cases, perhaps to bring the gospel, has remained to stay. And particularly we, in this southernmost portion in Africa, have such a stake here that this is our only motherland. We have nowhere else to go. We settled a country there. And the Bantu came in this country and settled certain portions for themselves. And it's in line with the thinking of Africa to grant those fullest rights which we also with you admit all people should have, we believe, providing those rights for those people in the fullest degree in that part of southern Africa which their forefathers found for themselves and settled in. But similarly, we believe in balance. We believe in allowing exactly those same full opportunities to remain within the grasp of the white man who has made all this possible. And we also see ourselves 
as a part of the Western world, a true white state in Africa, for the possibility of granting a full future to the black men in our midst, we look upon ourselves as indispensable to the white world. If there is to be a division in the future, how can South Africa best play its part, both to cooperate with the white nations of the world and at the same time to make friends in the black states of Africa in such a way that they will provide strength to the arm of those who fight for a civilization in which we believe. We are the link. We are white, but we are in Africa. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word, apartheid. And I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often. It could just as easily, and perhaps much better be described, as a policy of good neighborliness, accepting that there are differences between people. And that while these differences exist, and you have to acknowledge them, at the same time, you can live together, aid one another, but that it can best be done when you act as good neighbors always do. Mr. Prinslow, what is the basic philosophy underlying apartheid as a way of life? We Europeans who have lived in this country for more than 300 years have come to a conclusion which is strange to some people in the Western world, namely that the peoples of Africa and so the Bantu people of South Africa have a beautiful civilization of their own which is worth preserving. There are many facets of this civilization, for instance, the social warmth of the Bantu peoples, which we Westerners can rightly envy them. Now, we also have a peculiar Western adaptation to Africa. Therefore, we can say that the Bantu peoples are a flower and the Western peoples are a flower, each with a beauty of its own. Mr. Prinslow, as you are no doubt aware, most criticism of apartheid outside the Union is based largely on moral grounds. For example, the morality of separate residential areas in the cities of the Union, pass laws, lack of voting rights, and so on. How would you reply to this? As far as residential areas are concerned, the practical situation is that until about 10 years ago, there were no residential areas for urban Bantu people. It is only in the last few years that such areas were set aside on a planned basis and developed at a terrific pace as you can see all around you. This housing scheme, which now houses more than 30,000 urban Bantu who work in Pretoria, was a bare plain a mere four years ago. I think that is a complete answer to the so-called immorality of separate residential areas. In the political field, we are creating an outlet in that we are proclaiming Bantu authorities in all the major Bantu areas of the Union. We have already brought into life more than 300 such authorities where Bantu who have the inclination, the training and the moral courage to start developing their own people can do so with all possible assistance from the government. Is the government convinced that the African wants and accepts apartheid as a development policy? For obvious reasons, Many opponents of this policy tried to influence the Bantu people in the other direction. And like all new philosophies, like all new uh, uh, policies, we had to put our case to the Bantu people. And I can safely say today that the Bantu people are accepting the policy of self-development, which essentially is apart with apartheid essentially is in an ever-increasing tempo. I feel confident that the Bantu leadership of Africa, rural and urban, will, by the turn of next year, show in a most marked way 
that they are satisfied that this policy leads to their salvation. I have just announced in Parliament details of the granting of self-government to the Transkei. Transkei is the first Bantu homeland which has approached the government of the Republic to aid it by means of this great step on the road to independence, for which in its final form it rightly feels it is not yet ready. My government is prepared to grant the Transkei a new constitution which will create a parliament and a cabinet of ministers based on the principles of Western democracy. The details of the constitution will be worked out in consultation with the Bantu leaders of the Transkei. This will include the constitution of its parliament and the exercise of the franchise. The Transkei will have a wholly black parliament and cabinet since the white inhabitants of the Transkei will have no political rights there but in the Republic. This means that the government is willing to grant to the Bantu nations of South Africa the opportunity to work out their own destinies, just like all other states in other parts of Africa and Asia. An enormous program for the development of political self-realization of each national group is therefore being devised. The support already obtained for this program gives the lie to the propaganda that there is a widening chasm between whites and non-whites in South Africa. Despite provocation, criticism, and extremist demands, the Republican government is determined to solve the political problems of the country and its peoples in such a way that stability and tranquility for all is assured. In contrast to the chaos and turbulence elsewhere in Africa, the South African government has refused to allow itself to be provoked to undertake extreme measures in its primary and legitimate function of ensuring law and order. The new South Africa, which is being constructed by the measures announced today, holds within it great promise for the building up of friendship and cooperation between the races. It furthermore guarantees to each the retention of his own identity. All the nations of the world which seek to protect human dignity and the right to self-determination should give South Africa a fair chance to establish and develop its own Commonwealth of Nations. Chief Matanzima, I presume that you can tell us quite a lot about the possibilities of the Transkei. Say, for instance, in the event of total independence, uh, would you say that the Transkei has the manpower and the talent to run its own affairs? The Bantu people of the Republic of South Africa are the most development of all the Banu states in the continent of Africa. And there is no doubt that there is plenty of manpower for self-determination in the Transkei. Could you tell us what the future possibilities of the Transkei are? The Transkei is a country with wonderful resources for its future. We have agriculture, coal deposits, copper deposits, marble, and building of dams. As a sign of development, we have big irrigation schemes now under construction in the St. Max district, and factories in the Mtata area, and also the Sita Falls will provide hydroelectric power stations. Have you any Bantu at the moment trained as medical doctors and veterinary officers? There are several Bantu who have qualified as doctors and veterinary officers. And what about lawyers and magistrates? The Bandu in the Transkayan territories have their own judicial system. They have their magistrates, lawyers and prosecutors. I am also a judicial officer.
and no country in the world can achieve greater heights for itself by training on the court of a fellow nation. We shall become noble sport. We shall fight for our existence and we shall survive. The Republic is the only sure and stable friend that the Western nations have in Africa. We are here to stay, and we are here to aid all others in whatever they may need and can get from us. We have, for a very long time, developed in South Africa a nation of our own, friendly, prosperous, progressive. We hope that the rest of Africa will become likewise. Fortunately, even former opponents of the Republic, those who were in favor of a monarchy, are now prepared to give it full loyalty and cooperation. We are very happy to be a united people. Of course, there has been sensational journalism and conditioned reporting, which created the impression that there would be great difficulties ahead of us. We have no doubt that all this will pass. Certain restricted measures have to be taken recently, mainly to ensure the protection of the masses, of all races, who seek peace and order. The record of stable government will continue in South Africa. Surely it must be a record. Six prime ministers and only five changes of government in 50 years. However, in the future, we will seek the same form of stability in government, in the Republic, which should ensure stability too in the economic life of the country. Not for us, the sudden constitutional upheavals which created dictatorships in certain parts of Africa, chaos in the Congo, and forms of multiracial government elsewhere which only create the desire for domination by one over the other without any economic certainty developing. We seek the gradual development of each of our groups in a certain direction. Here the solution is sought by openly retaining the white man's guiding hand, which elsewhere is the hidden guarantee of industrial development and even good administration. Here we follow the example of the nation in creating separate chances of development for each of our racial groups. We seek to give the opportunity for cooperation in a novel way by the creation of a Commonwealth of Southern Africa as our ultimate aim. And in this Commonwealth, cooperation and consultation will be able to take place between all racial groups on the highest level. May this peace and prosperity and aid to all be made possible by the cooperation of our friends in the Western nations.
All that I can say is our opponents who wanted us out of the Commonwealth have won their wish, but they've lost their cause. population of South Africa has been shocked to the depth of its soul by the tragedy that unfolded itself in the House of Assembly this afternoon. It is my sad duty to express on behalf of all the tremendous sense of loss which overwhelms us all on this tragic day. A cedar of the Lebanon has fallen. The man who was master hand safely steered our ship of state for the past eight years is no more. <laughs> 